According to a recent survey, 77% of Americans who were surveyed said they believe Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth and died for our sins. 77%. That's a rather amazing figure. 77% claim that they believe in Jesus. With so many people claiming to believe in Jesus, we would expect our American society to be dominated by a biblical worldview. Christian values should be the norm everywhere we look. But we all know that's not the case. That is far from what we see in our society. So obviously there is a disconnect somewhere with many, with what they claim to believe and how it is lived out in their day-to-day -day life. While the vast majority claim to believe in Jesus, the sad reality is for many that profession of faith is not a genuine saving faith at all. This morning we are going to be reminded that all, not all belief is the same. Just confessing that you believe some facts about Jesus is not the same as putting your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Knowing who He is is not the same as being known by Him and having a relationship with Him. My prayer is that by the time we're done with our passage this morning, you will know for certain if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and know if you know Him and if He knows you as well. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 7 as we continue in our study this morning through the book, The Gospel According to Matthew. Remember, we are in a section known as the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon delivered by Jesus on a mountainside in Galilee. And we are in the conclusion of this sermon as he wraps up this amazing uh, sermon that he delivered in Galilee. And we've seen as he is finishing up that he provides us with a series of illustrations so that we might understand very clearly that there are two, only two options in life. Either we will follow Jesus and be given eternal life, or we can reject Him and be on our way to eternal torment. And after dealing with the topic of the wide and the narrow gate of producing good or bad fruit, He now provides us with a very clear and a very serious warning. In fact, these next few verses are truly some of the most chilling verses in all of Scripture. Because it deals with those who delude themselves into thinking they were saved, only to discover on Judgment Day that they weren't. It's a wake-up call for all who read these words, for us this morning as well, that we might be sure of where we are at in our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we would not be surprised on Judgment Day. As we begin, we see an answer to the question of who will be received into heaven. Chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. We are reminded of a very important truth here. That is a profession of faith, just saying some words, is not the same as having true faith. Reality, words are rather cheap, and many people claim many things. But just because we profess with our lips something does not mean that we truly believe it. Because Jesus warns us, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word translated Lord here is the common word used for Lord throughout the New Testament. It's kurios. It means Lord, it means Master, it means God. When used of Jesus or the Father, it's a recognition of their deity. To call Jesus Lord is an affirmation that He is the sovereign King, that He is in fact God. He is ruler, sovereign over all the universe. And to say it twice is a way to make a firm affirmation of this statement. Those who say this are acknowledging accurately the truth. Jesus is Lord. He is sovereign master over all. He is almighty God. That is a true statement. Clearly, it is a true and important affirmation to make. Same affirmation that every true believer will make. That means these people have correct doctrine, at least on this point. They understand and affirm who Jesus truly is. They know His name and they affirm He is Lord. All good things, all affirmations most of us in this room have made. And we would think that such a confession would mean all these people are saved. They say, Lord, Lord, they know who Jesus is. But Jesus warns us, not everyone who says that, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will be welcomed into heaven, but rather only those who do the will of His Father. So then we are reminded that a confession of faith is not enough to save someone. We must do the will of the Father if we are going to be guaranteed entrance into heaven. 
Now understand very clearly, Jesus does not mean to imply in any way that we earn our way to heaven. We can't. It's impossible to do so. He's not saying here that faith isn't enough. You must earn your way into heaven by doing something. That's not what he is saying here. Rather, he is highlighting that a mere confession of faith is not the same as having true saving faith. True saving faith will always result in obedience to God's word. So then if you confess Jesus is Lord, but you never obey his word, you never submit yourself to his will, then you don't really believe he is Lord. And that is what he is talking about here. Jesus later in Matthew 21 used an illustration of two sons. Both heard the command of their father. First one said, I'll do it, but then he never went out and did what his father told him to do. The second one at first refused, but then changed his mind and went out and did as his father commanded. And Jesus said it was the second son who really obeyed and did the will of his father. And his point was that actions speak louder than words. And if we truly believe that Jesus is our Lord, that will be shown in our obedience, in our commitment to do the will of the Father. Jesus said this in John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. See, it is the Father's will that we believe in Jesus and are saved. This is not just talking about a confession with our lips that Jesus is Lord, but to put our faith and our trust in the person of Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that is the will of the Father. It's a confession that He is Lord, but it's more than just words. It's a true belief, and that's what brings about change. And it's only those who have true faith in Jesus that are doing the will of the Father. And those who do the will of the Father are guaranteed entrance into heaven. Jesus continues in verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Clearly, Jesus is proclaiming himself to be God in the flesh. Because notice what he says. He is the one who's going to determine who gets into heaven and who doesn't. He is the one before whom all men will appear and give an account. Jesus knew who he was. He never hid it from anyone who was listening to his words. It's not a belief we made up some hundred years after Jesus' death. He made it very clear he was and is God in the flesh. And he's proclaiming himself here again as Messiah. He says, many will say, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. We prophesied, we cast out demons, we performed miracles. Clearly, these people were very religious people during their times on earth. They did many good things. And they even say they did it all in the name of Jesus. And so if we take them at their word, that they're not lying here as they stand before Christ, then that means they did a lot of good things with their life. They belonged to churches. They professed with their lips. What they did, they were doing in the name of Jesus. Clearly, they did many good, even amazing things. To prophesy can refer to telling the future, but most often it refers to simply teaching or proclaiming a truth. And so these are those who taught, who preached from pulpits, those who did miracles, who were workers of wonders. This is clearly referring to people that spent their life in public ministry, missionaries, pastors, bishops, teachers, leaders in the church, those who did good works and they did them in the name of Jesus. And they seem rather surprised here that Jesus won't let them into heaven. They say, but wait, 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 wait. We did all these things in your name. That, that should be good for something. We should get in because of that. We know you are Lord. We worked in your name. Look at what we did. But their objection reveals their heart. Because notice what they say. They focus all on what they did, not in whom they believed in. And that reveals the heart problem these individuals had. Because it's not about what we do that guarantees our entrance into heaven. It's about whom we know. And these will sadly make the horrible mistake thinking that somehow we can earn heaven ourselves. And they basically argue here before Jesus, look, we were good people. We, we did good things with our life. But the Bible is clear. What we do cannot gain us heaven. You could be the most powerful and influential pastor, teacher that the world has ever seen, but if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it will not gain you entrance into heaven. Entrance into heaven is based solely on who we know. 
Sadly, these individuals are like Judas. Remember, Judas did some amazing miracles on his time on earth. He was one of the twelve. He walked with them. He cast out demons. He did miracles in the name of Jesus. In fact, he looked so good on the outside that all the other disciples thought he was clearly one of them. He was a saved person. But he wasn't. He ended up being the one who betrayed the Lord. Just because someone can minister in the name of Jesus doesn't mean they have true saving faith. It doesn't mean that they truly know Jesus or that Jesus knows them. Because Jesus will say to these people, depart from me. I never knew you. The Greek word there that's used for know is gnosko. It means to know or to recognize, to have a personal relationship with someone. Now, Jesus is certainly aware of who these individuals are. He is omniscient. He is God. He knows everyone whom he has created. But when he says, I never knew you, he's talking about, I, I never had a personal relationship with you. I never had an intimate relationship with you. And that is the sole determiner of who will be received into heaven. Does Jesus know you personally? If he does, you are guaranteed entrance into heaven. But if he doesn't know you, you will never pass through those gates no matter how long of a resume you might have. No matter how many good things you do, no matter how many miracles you might do, no matter how much you've done for others, if Jesus does not know you, you're not getting in. Entrance to heaven is based solely upon knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's why this is a crucial topic for every one of us to understand. See, saving faith is not just an intellectual assent that you acknowledge something is true. Saving faith is more than simply saying you know something to be true. Saving faith is a commitment and a trust in the person of Jesus Christ. These people did works. They even believed intellectually the facts. But they never had put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And so Jesus said, I never knew you. These people have faith like the demons. James 2.19, we read this. You believe that God is one, you do well. Demons also believe and shudder. The demons believe the facts about who God is. In fact, they have perfect theology when it comes to defining who God is. They know He exists. They profess it. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, throughout the Gospels, the demon-possessed people profess that He is the Son of God. They believe God is one. They believe He is Lord. But that fact doesn't save any of them. Because while they know the facts, they do not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They do not bow before Him in submission. And these demons reflect the same type of belief that those who appear before Jesus in Matthew 7 will have. They have a belief about the facts, but not a belief and trust in Jesus. See, to believe something is true is not enough. These people will have never given their lives to Jesus Christ, and so sadly, they will not be welcomed into heaven. These are sobering verses because they reveal a startling and important truth. Not everyone who claims to believe in Jesus is saved. Jesus warned very clearly, just calling him Lord, Lord, even saying it twice, even doing great things in his name, won't guarantee you a place in heaven. We must place our faith in Jesus personally if we are going to be assured entrance into heaven. That's a rather important topic. Because Jesus warns us, not everyone who confesses belief in Jesus is saved. Now, most everyone in this room has confessed belief in Jesus. And so we need to ask ourselves, how do we know that our faith is genuine? How can we be sure that Jesus knows us and we know Him? How can we be sure that we don't end up being like one of these people and find ourselves on Judgment Day being told, depart from me, I never knew you? Well, it is possible to have complete assurance that our faith is real. We can know that our faith is genuine and Jesus knows us by name. It's not just live your life the best you can and hope that He knows you someday. That's not what the Bible tells us. We don't need to worry that we'll get to Judgment Day and be like these. We don't need to worry, am I saved or am I not saved? Because the Scripture provides us with evidences of saving faith. The Scripture provides us with the way to examine our life and ensure that we truly be in the faith so that we know what Christ will say to us on Judgment Day. And so we're going to look at four questions that we can use in evaluating the nature of our faith. Now, these are not designed to be used to look at another person, but they are designed for our own personal reflection. These are four questions that if we can answer yes to each one of them, 
then you can be assured your faith is absolutely genuine and Jesus knows you. But if you can't honestly before God answer yes to each of these four questions, then there is serious concern for you this morning. And if you find yourself in that situation, I encourage you to please come talk to me after the service. Because I don't want anyone to leave our time this morning wondering, am I saved or not? I want you to have absolute assurance of where you stand. That you know either, yes, I am saved, Jesus knows me and I'm headed to heaven, or I'm not saved and I need to get saved. So pay close attention as we go through these questions. Reflect upon them. Use them as you talk to others. Because these reveal if you know Jesus as your Savior and if He knows you. And our first question is this. Have you responded to the Savior? That is, have you responded to the truth of the gospel message? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? That's the first place to start in any quest for assurance of salvation. Have you believed, as the scriptures tell us, that Jesus Christ is the perfect, sinless Son of God? That He came to earth, that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins? Do you believe that He was buried and three days later rose from the grave and now He awaits for His own in heaven? It's not just believing those facts to be true, but have you responded to that truth by placing your trust and your commitment, your faith in Jesus alone? See, we need to believe the facts, but it's not just believing the facts that saves us. Because these people whom Jesus warns us about, they apparently know the facts. They know who Jesus is. They call Him Lord. They do things in His name. But they did not have a personal relationship. They never put their trust in Jesus. The demons believe the facts, but they do not submit to Him. So then we see the difference that is required for us to be saved. We must place our trust in Jesus to be saved. And that is more than just mentally agreeing that something is true. There's a difference between believing the facts and exercising faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let me be clear. We do not earn our salvation in any way, shape, or form. The scripture is very clear on that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. It's not something we do. It's not something we earn. We don't earn credit or favor with God by what we do. But the difference between a faith that is saving and genuine and one that is false is the object and the nature of our faith. Saving faith means we put our trust in the person of Jesus. We believe the truth that He is God, and so we give ourselves willingly to Him. And when we do that, He has promised to graciously give us the gift of eternal life. True faith also involves repentance. According to the Scripture, repentance of sins is bound up with faith. They go hand in hand. You cannot be a true believer if you have not repented of your sins. To repent is to change direction, to change your mind. It's that the focus of your life turns from following sin to following Jesus. To repent of your sin means you turn 180 degrees and you stop going the direction you were and you start going towards Jesus Christ. It involves a complete and total desire to change the course of your life and follow Jesus. And that's what happens at the same moment that you put your faith and trust in Him. Now, to repent does not mean you become perfect. It does not mean you never fail or sin. But one who has repented has forever changed the direction of their life. They desire now to live for God, not for themselves. And the reality is, if you've never done that, if you've never repented, then you have not yet exercised true saving faith. True faith involves a recognition of the facts of the gospel, which then responds in repentance of sins, and by faith, giving yourself to Jesus. And that is something these individuals in Matthew 7 never did. Because their reason of why Jesus should allow them into heaven is all based on what they did, not in whom they believed in. Now, if you were to stand before Jesus this very day, and he were to ask you, why should he allow you entrance into heaven? What would your answer be? If you answer that he should let you in because of what you did, if you appeal to the good things you did throughout your life, you say, well, I, I tried to be good, I, I did more good than bad, I, I was pretty good compared to someone else, well, then you are evidencing the same heart that these in Matthew 7 did. You are evidencing the reality that you really don't know Jesus as your Savior. Because the only answer that a true believer should answer to that question of why should Jesus allow you into heaven is something like this. Jesus, you should allow me into heaven not based on anything that I've done, but based upon the reality that we have a relationship. You know me. 
I trust in you. I believe your word and you promised that you would save me. And I believe that. You should let me in because I belong to you and, and we have a personal relationship. And because you know me, you should let me in. That's the only proper response to why should Jesus let you into heaven. And if we have placed our faith in Him, if we have repented and trusted in Him, then we can have the absolute assurance that our Lord does in fact know us. And our Lord has promised to welcome all who come to Him. No one who exercises that kind of faith will ever be turned away. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, Jesus said. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Jesus promised, if you come to him that way, he will welcome you. There is no one who comes before, the uh, comes before the Savior and bows before the Father in humble adoration, seeking to put their faith in Jesus, who will ever be turned away. He will welcome everyone who comes. And that's what gets us into heaven. If you have responded properly to Jesus, you can have the assurance that your faith is genuine. That's the first question to ask ourselves. But there are more. Second question is, have you received the Holy Spirit? See, the Scripture teaches that at the moment of salvation, every believer is instantly filled by the Holy Spirit and is therefore transformed. Paul writes this in Romans 8, 9. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. So then the possession of the Spirit is the mark of every true believer. There is no such thing as a believer who does not have the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So if you have received the Holy Spirit, that is a guarantee that Jesus knows you as His own and your faith is in fact genuine. So how do you know if you have received the Spirit? Well, some would say if you speak in tongues, that's how you know you have the Spirit. Others would say if you fall on the ground or lose control of your body, that's how you know you have the Spirit. Others teach you've got to have an emotional experience, and that's how you know you have the Spirit. But the reality is, none of those are used in the Scripture as a biblical evidence of having the Spirit. In fact, there are three specifics that the Bible gives us that are evidence if the Spirit is in your life. And the first is, are you convicted of your sin? Because the Holy Spirit's role is to convict us of sin. Jesus said this in John 16, 8, speaking of the Spirit. And He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. We see throughout the Scriptures this truth, that if you have received the Holy Spirit, you will be convicted of your sin. You can no longer do sinful acts without being convicted of it. It's part of what happens when you become a believer. You are no longer able to pursue sinful patterns of behavior without being horribly convicted. If the Spirit dwells within you, you will no longer pursue sin. In fact, if you do continue to pursue sin, you will become more and more miserable. Why? Because you are going against the God who indwells you. You are leading, living in a way that is grieving the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will convict your spirit. If you are convicted of sin when you do it, it's not evidence that you aren't saved. It's actually evidence that you are saved because the Spirit is convicting you that you're doing something wrong. But if you can sin, and you can live in sin, and you can do things that are against God's Word, and you really don't feel any conviction about it, well, that is a serious warning signal. Now, certainly believers can sin. We can ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if you are a true child of God, and you are living in sin, if you continually ignore the Spirit's prompting, then God will begin to discipline you. And God promises to discipline His children. Hebrews 12.6 for those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. So then, if you are a child of God, and you are sinning, the Spirit will convict you. And if you ignore that, God's going to discipline you. And His discipline can be kind of severe if you continue to rebel against Him. But if you are sinning, and there's no conviction, and there's no discipline, well, then that's likely because you don't belong to the Lord. So then our response to sin reveals the truth if the Spirit dwells in us or not. If you are convicted when you sin, that's a good thing. If you feel no conviction, no discipline, then that is very serious. There's another evidence we have in the Scripture of being filled with the Holy Spirit, and that is that those who are filled with the Spirit have a love and a desire for the things of God. They will have a love for God, they will have a love for God's people, and a love for His Word. We read this in 1 John 4.12. No one has beheld God at any time. 
If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Throughout 1 John, we learn that the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is our actions, is our desire and our love for God and his people. And so you need to ask yourself, do I truly have a desire to know God? Do I want to know him more? Do I want to love him? Do, do I want to show that love to others? If we do, if we love God and we love others, that's an evidence of the Spirit because a natural sinful man does not love God. A natural sinful man does not love other people. A Spirit-filled person will seek to show love in all things. There's a third characteristic of a Spirit-filled person, and that is they have the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22. fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, we looked at this last week. Remember, a good tree bears good fruit. These are evidences of the Spirit's work in the heart of a believer. Now, clearly, we are never as loving or never as joyful as we could possibly be. There's always room for improvement in these areas. But if we are Spirit-filled, these are all character qualities that will be present in some form or another in our life. In fact, they increase as we grow in our maturity with Him. If you see these things in your life, it is evidence that the Spirit dwells within you, and that means you belong to Him. But if you have none of these things, then that is a cause for concern. So then, do you have the Spirit living within you? If you do, then you know you are saved. If you feel conviction over your sin, if you have a love for God and His people, if you see the fruit of the Spirit, then you can have the assurance that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And according to Ephesians chapter 1, the seal of the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of our future inheritance. So if we have the Spirit, it is assurance that our faith is genuine. God does not give His Spirit to unbelievers. This means that Jesus knows who we are and we belong to Him. So then if you have received the Spirit, you are guaranteed entrance to heaven. And that brings us to our third question. And that is, what is your reaction to the Bible? See, an individual's reaction to the Scripture, specifically to the commands of Scripture, reveals whether or not their faith is genuine or superficial. Jesus said this in John 14, verse 21 and then in 24. He who has my commandments and keep them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Jesus said very clearly, if you respond to his commandments with obedience, if you heed his words, then that demonstrates that you really do love him. If we react to the Bible by seeking to obey what we read, it shows that we have a heart that loves God. But if we respond with indifference, if we respond with rebellion, if we respond with anger, those are not responses of someone who truly loves God. Now, again, we know no one is ever perfect. We know we are not perfect, and God certainly knows we are not perfect. None of us perfectly obey all the commandments all the time. And Jesus doesn't say, you're lost if you disobey me one day. That's not what he's talking about. He's referring to the pattern and the direction of our life, the desire of our heart. If we respond to his commandments humbly, if we seek to obey, no matter how many times we fall, we are showing our love for him. But if we reject his commands, if we say those don't apply to me, I don't have to live that way. I don't care what he says. Well, that is demonstrating a heart that really has no love for the Lord. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. See, our, our obedience to the Scripture is the evidence that our faith is real. This verse says, belief is what brings eternal life. You don't earn eternal life. But disobedience brings condemnation. That's because true faith will always result in a heart that seeks to obey Him. And so we must ask ourselves, honestly, how do I approach the Bible? Do I love it? Do, do I want to learn more? Do I want to be in submission to what I read? Or do I honestly really not care what God says? Do I just want to do my thing and not worry about it? That reveals the truth of where our faith lies. There's a fourth question in evaluating if our faith is real. And that is we need to ask ourselves, are you revealing a changed life? Are you different than what you were before? 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. 
The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. See, the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are a new creature. Our very nature changes. And that change in our nature, that change in who we are, will reflect itself in a change in our actions. And if we look over our life, over the past year, over the time since we came to faith, we should see changes in our behavior that evidence that change of nature. Sinful patterns of behavior should have changed or ceased, or at least you're working on getting rid of them. Changes in personality that show that God is the one who is at work at, in us. These changes are evidence that we belong to Jesus. But if honestly there's been no change in you in the last year, if you're even a little worse than you were before, if coming to faith really didn't change anything about your desires or your routines or what you want to do, then that is cause for concern. Because it is impossible for a person to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and not be changed. And this truly is the final question for evaluating the reality of our faith. And it's one of the most important tests given to us in Scripture. If there is no change in our lives, if the words and the attitudes we display are no different than what we were before we confessed faith, if it's no different than the world, then we have cause for concern. But if our words reveal a heart that's been transformed by the Holy Spirit, then we have the assurance that we know Jesus Christ, and that means He knows us. And that means we will be saved on the day of judgment. In Matthew 13, Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seed. It's a great example of how actions reveal what is truly within our heart. And in that parable, Jesus showed us that saving faith results in a changed lifestyle. So if you want to know if you are truly saved, look at your life. Look at your fruit. Do your actions reveal you are one of His or not? Jesus said this in John 13, 35, By this all men will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, notice what Jesus didn't say here. He didn't say you will know they are mine by your accurate and precise theology. Even though that's important, that's not the test. He didn't say they will know you are mine by what you preach and teach. Even though that's important, that's not what he says. He doesn't say by what good deeds you do, by how much time you spend at the church, by how much of your paycheck you give. Even though all those things can be important and can be beneficial and glorifying to Him. He said they will know you are mine by the love you show. Because love reveals a heart that has been transformed. When, when we display true agape love that cannot be faked, when we truly love others and seek their interest ahead of our own, care for others, put others first, even when no one's looking, especially when no one's looking. That's the dramatic evidence that Christ has changed us. Because left to ourselves, we're pretty selfish people. And we don't love others selflessly unless Christ has done a work within us. So we can know if our faith is genuine by examining our fruit. Now clearly salvation is not determined by our actions. In fact, that's the trap Jesus is warning us against in Matthew 7. We don't look at our life and go, okay, let's, let me look at a checklist. I go to church every time the do doors are open. Uh, I give of uh, tithes. I serve in the nursery. I've been on mission trips. I even have a, an office at the church. I must be saved. I'm good. That's not what it means to examine the fruit in our life. It's not about just looking at the things we do. Rather, we look at the motive behind those actions. That really reveals our true fruit. Why do I go to church? Why do I serve? Why do I give of my time? Why am I doing those things? Am I doing those things because I truly love God and I believe this is what He wants me to do and I want to honor Him? Or am I doing it for a more selfish reason? Am I doing it to promote myself? Am I doing it because I like people to be nice to me? Am I doing it because I think it's going to earn me some special place in heaven? The answer to that question reveals whether you were saved or not, and that's a question that only you can answer. Because it's not just on what you do, it's why you do what you do. The ultimate evidence of a person's salvation is the fruit that they bear. That's why Jesus said in the passage right before this, a good tree can only bear good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, some people bear more fruit than others, but the reality is all believers are changed by Christ. A changed life, a changed motive, change desires. Those are the greatest evidence we have and the assurance that we have that our faith is real. Now, it's certainly important to know if there's a moment in time, a date when you prayed the prayer and gave yourself to Christ, but that's really not where you get your assurance of whether or not you're saved. That's a starting point. Then you look at your life since that point, and that gives you the confirmation of if 
it was a real confession or if you were just making a lip profession like these. We've seen the answer to the question, who will be received into heaven? It's only those who are known by Jesus personally. And we can know for certain that we are known by Him by asking ourselves these four questions. Have I responded to the Savior? Have I placed my faith in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation? Have I repented of my sin and given my life to Him? Have I received the Holy Spirit? Do I see the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in my life? And what is my reaction to the Bible? Do I seek to obey the Scriptures? Or do I really seek for ways to get around what I read? And am I revealing a changed life? Is my life different now than it was a year ago, or two years ago, or three years ago? Each of us should take the time to carefully consider these questions. Because your answer to these questions will cut through any self-deception that you might have. Your answers will reveal your true standing before God. And if you can answer honestly yes to all of these questions, you can be absolutely assured of your salvation. But if you can't answer yes to every one of those questions, then there is real reason to be concerned of where you're headed. This is not a game. This is not just something we read about. Heaven and hell are very real places. And if your belief in Jesus is not genuine, if it's only lip service, then you are headed straight to hell. And that is the warning of our Lord in this passage. You are in danger of being one of those whom Jesus warns of, who confesses belief, but will stand before him and hear, depart from me, I never knew you. If you have any concern, if you might hear those words, please come talk to me after the service. See, we need not ever worry, does Jesus know us? If we will just take the time to examine our lives, we can be certain that he does know us. He knows all those who truly believe in him. And we can rest in that truth. That when we come to him in true faith, he promises to receive us as his own. And we who have put our faith in him will not hear, I never knew you, depart from me. Rather, we will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your rest. And that is what we long and look forward to hearing with great anticipation. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we thank you for your words. We thank you for these concluding words on the Sermon on the Mount. Stark warning that we might use to evaluate our own hearts and ensure that we are right before you. Thank you for giving us clarity that cuts through our self-deception and reveals the heart of the issue. Thank you for giving us the assurance that when we have truly put our faith in you, when we mean what we say, when we call you Lord, and we not just believe it with our heads, but we have committed to you with our heart, that is an act of worship that you receive. May we be assured and know that we have eternal life by putting our faith in you. Give us a heart and a passion to reach out to those who do not know you, that we might warn them of what is coming so that they might come to true faith in you as well. Thank you that faith is a free gift, that you give it freely to all who come. Thank you for the work that you have done in our life. Thank you that you have transformed us, that you have made us new creatures. We thank you for the work that we see in our life as we see that our attitudes are different than what they were. We don't want to sin. We want to do what's right. And we know that's not of ourselves, but it is a fruit of your spirit working within us. Thank you for giving us tangible things we can look at and be assured of our standing before you. We look forward to the day when we will see you and hear the words, well done. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We give you all the honor and all the glory, for it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.